Paper making is one of the oldest crafts in the world. Making parchment from animal skin dates back to 2500 BC. And this is the last place in the US that still makes it using traditional techniques, like scraping off every piece of hair from goat hides. In Egypt, villagers invented papyrus paper at least 5,000 years ago. These craftsmen are among the last in the world to still make it. We visited five countries to see how artisans in different cultures are preserving the craft and making sure it is still standing. This is one of the last places in the world that makes papyrus paper. People in this small Egyptian village reinvented the ancient process in the 1970s. And the industry thrived selling papyrus art to tourists. But today, there's little demand for the paper. And the plant is nearly extinct in Egypt. Those that remain are determined to carry on this piece of Egypt's history. We visited El Karamus to see how the ancient craft is still standing. Atef Mohammed Shahaita spends about two hours harvesting papyrus by hand from the single acre he owns. It takes a year for a papyrus seedling to grow to this size. After it's cut down, it grows back in one or two months. At one point, the village's land was filled with the plant. But today, there are only 10 acres left. Atef carries the plant about a mile to his workshop, where he employs seven people. They chop the stalks based on the size they want the paper. Then, workers spend the entire day cutting the papyrus into thin strips using a fishing line. This method is more efficient than the ancient process. But it's still exhausting. The strips soak in hot water mixed with potassium hydrate for a couple days. The chemicals speed up the fermentation process. Then they rinse the strips with water and chlorine to lighten the color. Workers lay out the wet papyrus strip by strip. Each sheet of paper has two layers, one vertical and one horizontal, to strengthen it. Then the stack goes into the compressor to dry. After that, the sheets are sandwiched between pieces of cardboard to soak up any leftover moisture. Atef sells the paper to artists across the village including Saeed Tarahan. He started out farming the plant, and today, he works as an artist. But since the COVID-19 pandemic put a halt on tourism, he struggled to find a market. He had to close down his shop and lay off his workers just a couple weeks ago. Now he works out of his home. All of Said's paintings include ancient Egyptian motifs to pay homage to papyrus's origin. Atef 
فاحنا محتفظين واخد بالك بالكلام ده وعارفين قيمته. Egyptians invented papyrus paper at least 5,000 years ago, replacing clay tablets and revolutionizing the written word. They used it for things like marriage contracts and shopping lists. They also turned the plant into a weaving material for sandals and baskets. Cheaper paper made from wood pulp or plant fibers eventually replaced papyrus paper, and the plant became nearly extinct in Egypt by the early 1800s until an art professor and an engineer brought back seeds from other African countries in the 1970s. They set up plantations and workshops in El Karamus. And papyrus became the center of the local economy. Almost everyone in the village was involved with processing raw materials or making artwork to sell to tourists. Saeed got into papyrus because his cousin was the art professor who helped revive it. He remembers it as a turning point for the village. But after the Arab Spring uprisings in 2011, Tourism in Egypt crashed. The country saw a 63% drop in visitors over the following years through 2016. And the market for papyrus paper nearly vanished. A decade later, the industry had just started to recover when the pandemic hit. Saeed has gotten just one order in the past week. A painting like this normally sells to tourist shops for 50 Egyptian pounds, or $3. Bigger and more detailed pieces go for up to 500 Egyptian pounds, or $32. But with sales down, Saeed has had to work another job to keep his business afloat. And he says he'll do everything he can to save the art. Atef is also determined to keep Egypt's history alive. And with Egypt's tourism industry expected to recover this year, Saeed is holding out hope for papyrus. أنا توقعي وحدك إنه لهذه الحرفة الازدهار إن شاء الله بدليل حجم المتاحف اللي بتنشأ وحدك في في مصر وهي عموما السياحة في مصر تمرض ولا تموت. Paper making has been the heart of this Indian town's economy for at least five centuries, and a lot of the work is done by hand, one sheet at a time. This factory can make 10,000 sheets in just a day. But in a modern world full of automated paper mills, how is a 500-year-old industry still standing? The work at Kalpana Handmade Papers in San Ganer starts with waste. The workshop recycles scraps from garment factories that would otherwise be thrown away. Nimi Chant Saini is the owner and oversees every step of the process. Bigger pieces go through this shredding machine. Within seconds, a pile of pulverized fabric comes out the other end. Workers dump over 200 pounds of shredded fabric and paper into this tank. One batch takes 1,500 liters of water. The mixing used to be done entirely by hand, which took triple the amount of time as it does today. Now, the machine can turn out pulp in under two hours. Then, it's time for the most crucial step, turning the pulp into paper. This skill requires years of training. Now, this is a very difficult task for every person. 
it takes two people to spread the pulp evenly onto the sieve. The amount varies depending on how thick the paper will be. सबसे बड़ा मुश्किल काम यही है इसको जो बिल्कुल अपने स्टेट रखना ये पर सीट वेट के हिसाब से होती है तो इस पल्प के नाप से ये डाल रहे हैं अकॉर्डिंग उसके कि जितनी थिकनेस हमको चाहिए A piece of cloth goes on top of the pulp so that the sheets don't stick together. For specialty paper, workers add extra decorations like these rose petals. They do this 1000 times until the batch is complete. Then the stack goes into the hydraulic press. पहले सर इस पे क्या होता था कि हम इसके ऊपर कुछ लकड़ी का फंटा लगा करके इस पे कुछ वेट रख करके और उस फिर पानी निकालने के बाद में फिर क्या होता था कि इसको हम दीवारों को चिपका के पेपर को Now they use heavy machinery to press the stack and send it to the upper level where there's sunlight. They remove each piece of cloth one by one so it can be reused in another batch. ये फट करके खराब नहीं हो जाएगा तब तक हम इसको यूज करते रहेंगे. The sheets hang out to dry for 2 days. Then a machine called a calendar smooths out each piece. ये चद्दर है लोहे की इसके बीच में ये दोनों रोल के बीच में जाएगा मशीन में Workers say that the paper's texture changes drastically after this process. Finally, with the help of a giant paper cutter, the worker slices stacks of paper down to size. The scraps will make their way back into the process from the beginning. Paper making communities called Kogsis came to India around the 16th century and eventually settled in the town of Sanganer. A nearby river made it the perfect place for making paper. But when the British came to power in the 1800s, they started importing paper from mills abroad. The local workshops that made paper by hand couldn't compete, and many closed down. Mahatma Gandhi stepped in during the 1940s during his fight for Indian independence. He advocated for local handicrafts, and is credited today with saving the handmade paper industry. Even though this factory's process has modernized with some machines, the sheet by sheet technique. sets it apart from most mass produced paper ha se jo banaya hua paper hai usme ek alag looking alag uski jo ek design us paper ki ek alag hi dekhne ko milti hai jo ki mill made se alag hat karke hai they ship all over the world and use the paper to make hundreds of different products about 40 employees design things like calendars jewelry boxes तो आप इस बॉक्स को जैसे देखेंगे तो इसमें जो बाहर हम कार्डबोर्ड यूज कर रहे हैं वो दैट इज अ रिसाइकल कार्डबोर्ड और अंदर जो आप पेपर देख रहे हैं इट इज अ हैंडमेड पेपर इन ऑर्नमेंट्स क्रिसमस ट्री पे जैसे डेकोरेट करें तो ये पूरा इको फ्रेंडली प्रोडक्ट है द वर्कर्स हियर टेक प्राइड इन देयर क्राफ्ट सबसे बड़ी बात ये है कि एक ये वेस्ट चीज से हम इस पेपर को तैयार कर रहे हैं को बहुत हमको गर्व महसूस होता है कि हम अपने हाथ से जो एग्ने एक एक हाथ की कोई चीज बना करके और हम उसको मार्केट में उतार रहे हैं एंड एज लॉन्ग एज पीपल नीड पेपर नीमी इज कॉन्फिडेंट हिज बिजनेस विल थ्राइव हैंडमेड पेपर की जो हाथ से बनाई हुई चीज है और इसकी लुकिंग जो है वो एक अलग पहचान है इस वजह से इसको रखना चाहते हैं इसकी डिमांड है मार्केट में दिस गोट स्किन इज अबाउट टू बी टर्न्ड इनटू पार्चमेंट एन ओल्ड काइंड ऑफ पेपर मेड फ्रॉम एनिमल स्किन It goes through a laborious process of having every last hair scraped off. The craft dates back to 2500 BC and this is the last place in the US that still makes it. Every piece takes at least 2 weeks to make and only a handful of people in the entire world know how. Parchment as a product almost hasn't survived. there was almost no need for it as a material but it was this centuries old work that helped Jesse Meyer save his family tannery we visited their facility in Montgomery New York to see how it's still standing making parchment is a messy craft it's cold and wet around the workshop but the lingering smell is something Jesse's gotten used to It all starts with the skin. Deer, goat, calf, and sheep skin are sent by slaughterhouses or local hunters. 
Jesse soaks it in a mixture of water and calcium hydroxide to break down the fibers, loosen the hair, and clean it. This is the longest part of the process, taking at least two weeks. Then it's time for de-hairing. Jesse scrapes at the skin, pushing the hair off. He uses a makeshift tool, a hundred-year-old piece of wood that has the perfect shape for the job. Even the hand tools that we use, most people have never seen before. And in some cases, they don't exist, and I've had to, you know, recreate these tools myself. After de-hairing, he removes the extra meat layers on the other side. They've installed machines to help speed this along, but sometimes, Jesse prefers the traditional way. The more involved you can be with your own hands, the better and more control you have over the end product. But there is a, a point where if you're doing this on a commercial scale to try to be efficient and more economical, you don't really have the ability to handle each one by hand. The hides then go through a thorough rinse. That adjusts the pH level after weeks of intense chemical treatment. Jesse selects some of the clean skins to be dyed in a large drum. He uses plant-based pigments and water to create a range of colors. As the skins tumble, they soak up the dye until they're saturated. He hangs the skins to dry overnight so that the color spreads evenly throughout. But most of the rinsed skins are left their natural white color and sent up to the dry room. Jesse stretches the skin to keep it flat while it dries. First, he scrapes the hide while it's wet to remove excess moisture. Then when it's dry, he shaves it to clear away tissue. He made this medieval knife with a saw blade, a threaded rod, and leather. Its proper Latin name is linellum, for its crescent moon shape. Sanding is the very last step. Jesse refines the surface, smoothing it out until almost every blemish is undetectable. Finally, the skin is now parchment. The first record of parchment dates back to 2450 BC. Famous ancient documents like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Magna Carta were all written on it for its durability. The use of parchment peaked in the Middle Ages in Europe, when it was mostly used for illuminated manuscripts and book bindings. Paper made from wood pulp or plant fibers was invented in China around 105 AD. It made its way across Asia, the Middle East, and Europe through the centuries with the rise of literacy and the printed word. It was faster and cheaper to make. It quickly industrialized and rendered parchment virtually irrelevant by the 16th century. Early in the 20th century, designers incorporated parchment into high-end furniture and decor, and it is still used for that today. Preserving history is what saved parchment in this business. Conservators use the material to mend old manuscripts, make copies, and restore missing pages. It's been a very niche product. It is something that happens alongside of leather production, and that's how I kind of rediscovered and have been trying to sort of reapply it since then. The rare craft saved his family's centuries-old tannery business, which has been in the country since his ancestors moved here in 1820. By the time Jesse took over, demand for leather was on the decline, and by 2005, keeping the business going was getting more difficult. That's when Jesse introduced parchment making. 
but he struggled to find out about the process. There are a handful of other companies around the world that do this sort of thing, and they're far, far away, and they, they've never told me how they do what they're doing, so I've had to try to figure this out in a vacuum, so it's me figuring it out as I go and what seems to work best for me. Because it's such an old medieval craft, anytime I would try to go look up information, a lot of times it was from medieval recipes that were written in Latin from 13, 1400. Eventually, parchment became such an important part of the business, Jesse changed the name from Meyer and Sons to Pergamina, which means parchment in Latin. And he found a niche of customers, conservators and designers who use the material in lampshades, upholstery, headboards, and even as wallpaper. No two pieces of parchment look the same, so, which is a, a blessing and a curse. It's part of the artistry. A single sheet starts at $100. What started out feeling like an albatross around my neck um, ended up becoming a way to help revitalize the family industry. I want to be proud of this and to be able to pass it on to my family and for people to know that skilled work like this is still being done in the world. It's being made right here in the United States by a family that's been doing it for 450 years. One sheet of traditional Vietnamese Zayzo paper can last 800 years. But the craft of hand making it is dying out. Only a few families in Bucking province continue to transform bark into paper. The process can take weeks, sometimes months. Fan Van Tum runs one of the last workshops in his village. Cho đến giờ phút này thì anh cũng chưa chưa nghĩ đến làm cái gì khác cả. As far back as the 13th century, this paper was widely used for printing historical records and making folk art. But industrialized paper mills have brought this craft to the brink of extinction. So how is this centuries-old craft still standing? The two trees that make the Sai Zha paper can be found in the forests of northern Vietnam. Workers harvest the bark between August and October, when it peels easily because of the heat. Tam is one of the last traditional Zai Zha paper makers in Zungo. He's been working in one of the last handicraft villages for 40 years. Today, he employs a small group of people. They soak the bark and cut it into two foot long pieces and separate the good kind from the bad. Grinding is one of the few steps that is done by a machine. Ngày xưa các cụ toàn dã bằng tay chứ không 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 có máy nghiền như bây giờ. But it still requires some physical effort. Tam pushes the bark with an oat stick to help it move through the grinder until it turns into a fine pulp. Sap from strips of wood from the maw tree will make the glue for the paper. Soaking it in water helps release it. Tam was 20 years old when he started making Saiza paper. He learned the trade from his father and takes pride in keeping traditional techniques alive. Tức là giấy thủ công của mình làm thì nó sẽ để được lâu lắm hơn là giấy máy. Even the tools they use are handmade. Wen Kong Wang is the last sieve maker in Zungo, who still makes the wooden frames that shape the paper from scratch. Nếu chú làm thợ mộc thì là khoảng 4 hơn 40 năm rồi. Còn như chú làm khuôn này thì là từ 30 năm trước. His frames can last up to three years and are essential to getting the paper just right. If the dimensions are even slightly off, the paper could be ruined. Thì khi xeo thì là cái cái lề này là cái những cái lề hay là những cái gió này là rất nhỏ, nó mới lọt ra cái chỗ đấy là cái tờ giấy nó rất bẩn. Gwen Thi Do begins forming the paper. She's been doing this job since she was 12, and her years of experience make her one of the best workers here. Cái này chị làm cũng lâu ghê rồi. Ba mấy năm, ba ba năm. She dunks the cream into the pulp mixture and sifts it until a perfect layer forms on top. It may look simple, 
but it's a skill that requires years of training. Mà bỏ ra ngoài đây mà nó bị rót như thế này, ví dụ như thành và tờ thì nó sẽ rúng, rúng thì cái tờ đấy mình lại phải bỏ đi. She uses a bamboo screen to separate the paper. It is also made by hand. Do Zui Thai has been crafting these intricate folding screens for over 40 years. He's a sixth generation bamboo maker and only sells to local artisans. Duo is so fast and precise, she can make 1300 sheets in one day. She brings the stacks over to the press. It slowly squeezes the excess water from the paper. Tom has been using the press since he opened his workshop in 1982. He peels and sticks the sheets onto a wall one by one and coats them with an extra layer of moss app. Cái cái nhựa này có tác dụng nữa, tức là nó để nó tách từng tờ giấy một ra. Mình sau khi mình múc múc thành tờ giấy. They stay on the wall for a week until they're completely dry. Paper making was the heart of the economy in Zungo for centuries. People used saw paper to make books and Dungo paintings, a popular folk art used to decorate homes during the Vietnamese New Year. But demand dwindled when paper factories opened in the area in the early 90s. By 2020, 75% of Vietnam's paper was factory made. Today, Tam mostly sells the paper to museums and national archives. Although he's kept the craft alive in his community, he still worries that it may end with him. Younger people haven't shown interest in preserving it. Con nhà tôi thì nó cũng tìm việc khác nó làm rồi, mà nó cũng làm được cái việc khác rồi, cho nên là cái nghề giấy này nó bị vất vả quá, thì đỡ mà là chúng nó cũng không không muốn theo. But Chan Hang Yoon is trying to change that. She founded the Zaw Project in 2013, a non-profit focused on preserving traditional paper making in Vietnam. When you touch the handmade paper, it's a very different feeling when you touch it and uh, when you use it, you know the material is come from nature. The organization buys and uses Tum's Saizaw paper to produce postcards, jewelry and artwork. The proceeds help support artisans who are working to keep Saizaw paper alive in their community. Yoon is also working to teach more young people and encourage them to use the paper. We combine between the traditional value and also like con contemporary and modern designs for young people, they are more interested in this craft. In the last nine years, the Zaw project has reached dozens of young artisans across Vietnam. It also restored a sense of pride in traditional paper makers. Vừa vất vả mà vừa phải có tay nghề, vừa phải, phải có sức khỏe, nó nhiều nhiều thứ lắm. For this community of paper makers, this craft has become a labor of love. Bởi vì tôi cũng yêu nghề, cho nên tôi mới làm được lâu năm như thế. Nếu như cái nghề này của anh mà bị mai một đi thì rất là tiếc, tiếc lắm. This paper is made from farm waste, some corn husks, stalks of sugar cane, but mostly Poop. Elephant poop. Hudson Chai Gawin, who goes by Pete, has been working at Poo Paper Park for about four years. Making paper without trees? is the priority number one, even if that means handling a lot of number two. Want to touch? Yeah. No. <laughs> K 
Can this model inspire people to take better care of endangered species? We visited Chiang Mai, Thailand to see how paper gets made using a very particular kind of worldwide waste. This is Gan Ploi. Trained caretakers called mahouts, like Ban Tong Shamnan Saadzi, can serve him up to 300 pounds of plants daily. Elephants can poop about 10 times a day. So there's a lot of dung laying around Merim Elephant Home where he lives. And Pupu Paper Park co-founder Kanokratan Sukontoman is happy to take it away. Tan pays nearby sanctuaries around $15 per bag and collects up to a ton of poop every week. Then it's Pete's job to turn it into paper. It feels good. <laughs> but seriously, how do you clean up caca? Well, first, Pete soaks it overnight in water to remove sand, clay, and rocks. The company uses no chemicals or bleach. Trained poo meisters sanitize the dung in boiling water for four to six hours. This kills bacteria and germs, but also softens the fibers. The longer it boils, the smoother the paper will turn out. Next, they drain the liquid and spread the cleaned, stringy dung to dry. That usually takes one to two weeks. Pete mixes the poop with grass, hay, or tree bark in this blender. Coconut husks or banana stalks act as binders, depending on which crops are in season. The third ingredient? Finally, they sometimes add non-toxic organic food dyes for color. All this means no two batches of paper are exactly the same. It takes two hours of mixing the raw pulp to get the right consistency. Then workers shape the mixture into balls and squeeze out the excess liquid. The wastewater will be used again to make more pulp or to fertilize fruit trees on the property. Each ball weighs about half a kilogram. They take special care to spread the pulp evenly. Tan and her husband Michael Flankman began developing this process in 2002. Then in 2009, during the economic recession, paper sales cratered. So the couple turned their process into an attraction open to the public. Visitors can participate in paper making or buy products at the boutique. They built Pupu Paper Park in a province known for elephant tourism. But there are no elephants here. Pupu 
It took two years to design and build the one and a half acre property. They used traditional natural building materials, like palm fronds and trunks from fast growing eucalyptus trees. Workers intentionally leave piles of dung along footpaths. In case visitors get lost, they're told to follow the turds. Tan is proud of every sheet of paper they make here. The sheets take 4 to 12 hours to dry, depending on the weather. If there's a defect in the paper, the team can put it back in the blender. Park employees use the paper to make greeting cards and all different kinds of origami art, like this decorative rose. And at an off-site factory, local villagers fulfill thousands of orders for these smaller roses. Each handmade flower is carefully twisted and dyed. A bouquet sells at the park for about $22. The founders employ locals from Chiang Mai province, a region known for its intricate art and handicrafts. Making paper out of poop isn't as crazy as it sounds. Researchers from China have experimented with paper made from panda poo. And in India, entrepreneurs are making stationery with rhino dung. In Thailand, turning poop into paper has the potential to support a dwindling species. Asian elephants have always played an important role in Thai culture. Kings would ride these massive animals into battle. ซ้ําประธานป่าไม้ไม้ช้างลากซุงนะฮะจากช้างลากซุงมาเนี่ยเขาลากมาตั้งแต่อดีตจนมาถึงปี 2500 เพราะฉะนั้นตกงานตกงานเราเป็นเจ้าของช้างเค้าก็ปล่อยซัมมาฮูทส์แอนด์เดอะเอลิเฟนท์ฟาวด์เวิร์คแอททัวริสต์เ
ต้องใช้ใจไม่ใช่เห็นว่ามันทําได้แล้วมันจะทําได้เอาไปทําอะไรต่อใช้อะไรได้อีกไหมอะไรอย่างเงี้ยแล้วคือมันเหมือนแบบเราก็พยายามให้เขาเห็นว่ามันมันใช้ได้จริงแล้วมันสนุกนะ